I'm here today to talk to you about propagators. So propagators are a really cool idea that comes from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1970s, uh, and then nothing happened on it for ages, but there's been a recent resurgence in interest. And I don't know about you, but for me, when a talk starts like that, like that I think it's going to be something pretty cool. <laughs> so I'll tell you something about the context in which these propagator things were invented. So Gerald, uh, Gerald Sussman was teaching lots of different subjects. He was teaching computer science and physics and electric circuits. And Gerald Sussman's favorite way to teach something is to write a program and give it to the students to read. And, and he was trying to do this for his electric circuit subject, and he found that the programming constructs that he had available to him weren't very good for expressing the kinds of things we want to talk about with electric circuits. For example, we have this sort of bidirectional cyclical flow of information from parts to other parts. And also, uh, it, something he noticed was the, the things we were teaching the students weren't necessarily the things that an expert would do. So he, he gave this example where he sort of said, oh, when an expert looks at this circuit, they're going to say, oh, well, gee, I don't know the voltage here, but I think it's probably 0 0.7 times the voltage over here, and I'm not quite sure on the resistance here, but I know the current through it. And he had these sort of little bits of information, and he kind of deduced whatever he could around the diagram, made some assumptions, if they turned out to be wrong, retracted them later. And he really didn't have a good model for talking about this kind of thing in a computer program. And so he came up with this idea called propagators, and some other people worked on it with him. Um, and they turned out to be useful for that, and they turned out to be useful for some other things as well. So the propagator model, as it's called, is a model of computation for highly parallel machines. And, um, and they sort of had this idea that in the future we'd have, we'd have sort of these computers the size of a grain of sand, and you'd buy computers by the bucket and put them into your concrete, and then you'd pave your driveway with computers. <laughs> That's not exactly what we're doing now, but we are running, you know, we are running a distributed system of parallel computers. So to a pretty close approximation, they were dead right. And so let's get into it. I will show you about the propagator model of computation. In the propagator model, we build these propagator networks. And a propagator network has two kinds of things in it. It has cells. This is a cell. They're rounded in all my diagrams. And a cell is a place where information can be. They don't have any smarts to them. They're simply a place information goes. So I can write to a cell, I can write a string like hello, I can write to a cell again, I can write the string compose. So these are these mutable places where information goes. And then, um, let's look at another example, we can make an input cell or an output cell, and we can build what's called a propagator. And a propagator is a thing that looks at some cells, and when stuff is in those cells, the propagator computes something and writes it to another cell. Propagators are independent, stateless machines. So the only information a propagator looks at comes from the cells it's connected to as input, and the only effect a propagator has on the world is to write to the cells that are connected as its output. So here I've used a function lift that says, turn this function into a propagator. So I've used the two-upper function, which uh, uppercase is a character, and I've built a two-upper propagator. Okay, so now I can write something into the input cell, my propagator is going to notice there's something in its input cell and it's going to write to the output cell based on what it's computed. And in this case, it's a capital Q. And we can read this cell and we can say, give me the content of the output cell, and it will say just Q. It says just because we're using the maybe data type because it's possible the cell has nothing in it, as we've seen. So we can have propagators with multiple inputs. So here I'm building three cells, input left, input right, and output. And I can make an addition propagator or an adder where an adder is a lift2 of the addition function. And so lift2 just turns a two-argument function into a propagator. Okay. And we haven't really seen anything interesting yet. All I've shown you is a cumbersome way to write functions. <laughs> but there's something really interesting that I kind of want to highlight, which is we're talking about addition. Oh, and so here's an example. If you put 3 and 7 in, the propagator will write 10. Hooray. So when we're talking about addition, or like when I think about addition, I think about an equation like this, you know, z is equal to x plus y. 
But when we're programming, that is not a quality. When we're programming, there's a directionality to this. We're saying, give me x and y, and I will give you z. It's not an equation. But it turns out if we have three, directional, uh, the, three of these directional statements, we can simulate that bi-directional equation. If you, you know, if you give me any two of these, I can give you the other one. And so the interesting thing about these propagator networks is that we can hook up lots of different propagators to lots of different cells in complex cyclical bidirectional networks. So here we're saying I can lift two with addition and attach it to these cells. I can lift two subtraction and attach it to these cells. I can do the same thing with the other ordering of cells. And so now I have a propagator network where if you tell me any two of these things, I will tell you the third one. So if the answer is 15 and then one of the add-ins is seven, then I can tell you the other one must be eight. Okay, and you can fill any of these in in any order. And I will tell you the other one. And the way we program with the propagator model is we build these little bidirectional networks and then we just sort of compose them. We plug them together and we can end up with these bigger bidirectional networks. I'm not going to show code anymore, but the code, like running code, working code for all these slides is available and linked at the end of the talk. So we can plug together a bunch of networks and we can get this Fahrenheit to Celsius or Celsius to Fahrenheit converter. Right, so if you tell me some Celsius, I can run it through this network in that direction and get you a Fahrenheit. Or if you give me a Fahrenheit, like say 75.2, I can run it the other way through this network and get you something sensible. Uh, right, so we can make these fun little networks and you know, run equations forwards and backwards. Let's look at another example. Let's propagate some Booleans. Here's a fun little network. So let's write true into this cell here. We can compute the negation of that. The negation of that is false, fine. Compute the negation of that, that's true, of course. Uh, we can compute the negation of that, oh, that, that's false. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, it just sort of oscillates forever. But not only that, I said we're going to run this in parallel. So this thing is going to oscillate forever, non-deterministically. That's not very cool. And right now, you're like, George, this is bonkers. We're at a functional programming conference. You can't just get up on there on the stage and say, hey, I've got this crazy mutable non-deterministic thing. It doesn't give you a sensible answer. So I'd better fix this. And how can we fix it? Uh, well, I'll have one attempt at fixing it first. So we could make some kind of ad hoc solution. Like here, I'll come up with a solution. We could have a data type like this. I've called this data type perhaps, and a perhaps A is either I don't know, or I know it's this one, or there's been a contradiction. So say you tell me it's false and you tell me it's also true, it can't be, you've contradicted yourself. And you can think of this as like a once writable variable. It starts off as unknown, and then we can write to it once and we get a known. So we can, write, we can do that with this function. So if I have unknown and I want to write an A, well, now you know A. If you already know B and you're trying to write A, that's actually okay as long as A and B are the same thing. Like if I already know the answer and then you tell me the answer, like I, I know, it's okay, I still know that. But if A and B are not the same, if you tell me it's true and you also tell me it's false, that's a contradiction. And of course, if I'm already in a contradiction and you try and tell me some more information, like I'm already inconsolable. <laughs> So now we can fix the preceding network by using this data type in all of our cells. And we can say, well, if I don't know, but then I, now I know true, I can compute the negation, and now I know this one's false, and I can compute the negation, and now I know this one's true. And now I want to tell the other one it's false, but it already knows it's true, so I've contradicted myself. And the nature of these propagator networks is that as soon as you hit contradiction somewhere, it just kind of propagates everywhere. So we've solved the problem. <laughs> You can run this network and you will always get the same answer, no matter how you parallelize it. It's just not a very useful answer. Okay, so being able to write to our variables only once solves a lot of our problems, but it actually makes our computational model kind of boring. It severely limits the number of interesting things that we can express with this kind of 
um, with this kind of model of computation. So we want to do, you know, we want to think about something else. We want to do something a bit better, something a bit finer grained. And this is where the incredible insight came from, which is a cell should not store a value. What a cell should store is everything I know about a value. A cell should accumulate partial information about a value. And whenever you want to write to a cell, you're adding new information. That's a bit fuzzy, so let's go through an example. Here I've got a Sudoku problem. It's a very easy Sudoku problem because it's only four by four. Um, but what we need to do is we need to put the numbers one, two, three, and four into each of these boxes. So say I'm interested in the value of this square here. Well, um, I'm going to look at its row. We need to fit the numbers one, two, three, and four into this row. We look at this column. We need to fit the numbers one, two, three, and four into this column and we need to fit the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 into this box. And we're going to use these three things to tell us bits of partial information. So we can look at this too. So we, we start off by knowing, well, it's got to be 1, 2, 3, or 4 because of the nature of the puzzle. This is, we don't know anything. I mean, other than the fact that the puzzle is the way it is, we, at this point we know nothing. We can look at the two which is in the same row as us, and the two says, look, I'm the two around here. You've got to be either one, three, or four. Okay, so we can add that to what we know. And then we can go and ask this one, which is in the same column as us. And the one says, look, I don't know what you are, but I know I'm a one, and therefore you've got to be two, three, or four. You can't be one as well. And the same thing with this three, it tells us you're either one, two, or four. And we can take these partial information, these bits of partial information, these sets of possibilities, and we can say, where is the overlap between all the possibilities of what we could be? All these little partial pieces of information can join together to tell us we must be four. That's the only possible thing that could go in this square, and that's what goes there. So this is an example of merging partial information. We've got possibilities about what the world could be, and we're going to shave off possibilities. Okay, and I'll show you a diagram of all the possible configurations of data we could have, and it looks like this. So this is what's called a partial order diagram, and this says um, at the bottom we've got one, two, three, and four, and then as we move upward through the diagram, we're removing possibilities. And each one of this, these lines corresponds to removing a possibility. So we move up through the diagram as we remove possibilities. Now, it's somewhat unintuitive, perhaps, that the set is shrinking, because normally when I think I'm gaining information, I'm learning things, I would think of a set as getting bigger. But remember, these are possibilities, so it's actually by removing possibilities that I know more information. So I move up this diagram, and I go from less information to more. At the beginning, at the bottom here, I don't have any information other than what's obvious from the nature of the puzzle. As I move up through the, the diagram, I have some information, like, gee, I've ruled out a number or I've ruled out two numbers. Uh, when I get further up still, I get full information. I know that square is exactly four. But you could also rule out all possibilities. Like if you've made an error solving your Sudoku puzzle, you could get to a contradiction. You could say, well, look, it, it couldn't possibly be anything anymore. And so that's this empty set here. We've ruled out all the possibilities. Okay, and each of the, this is actually a diagram of an ordering, a partial order. So we can say that if the possibilities are one, two, or four, that is strictly less information than if the possibilities are one or four. Because in the, in the upper one, we've ruled out the number two. Okay, and we can follow up these chains of lines to say, well, I can build a chain from one, two, four, through one, four to one. And so if the answer is one, two, or four, that's less information than saying the answer is one. Some things, this is a partial order, not a total order, and what that means is some things are incomparable. So if, if, so if we've got the set of possibilities two or three, or if we've got the set of possibilities three or four, one of those isn't more information than the other one. They're kind of describing different instances. We're kind of in two different worlds at that point. 
Okay, but it's not just things on the same row that are incomparable. Um, if we look at 1, 2, and 4 versus 3, well, certainly we've got more possibilities with 1, 2, and 4, but these are still incomparable because there's no way I can rule out possibilities to get to 3. We can only move up. And this kind of diagram, uh, this kind of partial order has a special property, which is that any two elements, say I could pick these two elements, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 4, any pair of elements has a unique least upper bound. So in this case, the least upper bound is exactly 1. And this operation, least upper bound, or I'm going to call it join because it works much better as a verb, this operation, join, is the key to making our propagators go. A partial order with a join is called a bounded, uh, and a bottom element of no information is called a bounded join semilattice. And a bounded join semilattice has laws! <laughs> yeah! It has a lot of laws, more than you might be used to. So it has an identity law which says if I try to join, if I try to get the least upper bound of wherever I'm currently at and no information, I stay where I currently am. I don't learn anything new from no information. That seems intuitive. Associativity kind of says that I can parenthesize least upper bounding and I'll always get up to the same one eventually. Commutativity says it doesn't matter which order the things are in to least upper bound. And idempotence, which, mean, which you might not be familiar with, especially in a two-parameter setting. But idempotence says, if you tell me exactly what I already know, I don't learn anything new. And that's another property that bounded join semilattices have. Uh, we can express this in Haskell with the type class. We've got join here written as the, the V thing. Um, and we've got bottom, which is our lowest element of no information. We can make a data type for Sudoku values that's one, two, three, or four. Uh, and then we could have, we could call possibilities a set of these values. And we could give a semi-lattice instance to possibilities by intersecting the sets. And the bottom is all the elements. Um, yeah, so that's how we could do that in Haskell. And the way we would make our propagators, propagator network work is cells hold on to semi-lattices and propagators always join information in. You never write to a cell, you never clobber whatever's there with what you want to write, you add whatever's there to what is known by that cell. And remember I said we always move up. It's very important that we only move up. And if you always join what, uh, whatever you've got with whatever's already there, you will always go up. If you take the least upper bound, you can only stay still or move up. And there's a name for something that always stays still or moves up, it never goes down, and that is a monotonic function. So our, our cells hold join semi-lattices, and our propagators, by nature of always joining into cells rather than writing directly, are always monotonic. So this, uh, this is the definition of monotonicity, so if x is less than or equal to y, uh, remember our, we had a partial order, that's this less than is from that partial order. If x is less than or equal to y, then f of x is less than or equal to f of y. That's what it means for f to be monotonic. You might be thinking that that means f is linear, but it doesn't mean that f is linear. It's a subtly different property. Here is a function that I've lovingly crafted in the Linux version of MS Paint. <laughs> and you'll notice that it's certainly not linear. Um, there are kind of some times where it plateaus for a while, and then maybe it goes up more steeply than it ever did before. This one happens to be continuous, but it doesn't even have to be continuous. Monotonicity just means that if I pick any two points and I draw an arrow between them, that arrow is up and to the right, or it's just to the right. So, you know, if you're an executive in the boardroom and you want to show your quarterly earnings, you really care about monotonicity. <laughs> And there are lots and lots of bounded join semi-lattices that we can choose. Our cells don't have to all hold on to the same values. We could have lots of different semi-lattices and we could accumulate different information between them in different ways. So remember, earlier we had a solution that was too big. 
when we could only write once, we ended up with a model that wasn't always very interesting. That ad hoc solution fits into this solution space. Bounded join semi-lattices gave us a really interesting and rich solution space that our really horrible ad hoc solution actually happens to fall into. That's pretty cool. There are lots of other join semi-lattices, so the perhaps data type I showed, sets with intersection, which we saw, remember we were shrinking sets of possibilities. We could also have sets with union, so we could actually grow, um, not possibilities, but we could grow what we know. Um, we could do interval arithmetic, so there's fun examples, in, like there's one in the repository where, um, where we could say, uh, you know, I have this measurement, it's uh, 15 millimetres plus or minus 2 millimetres. And then we could have other measurements, and then we could say, well, the area of this thing is going to be the multiplication of these two measurements, and it multiplies the error bars with them. Okay, so propagating with intervals is lots of fun. And many, many more. Uh, there's a lot more to say about propagators. I've only shown you one insight that really kind of got them back off the ground. Um, and it, there's been lots of further development since then, so it turns out we don't always need all the properties of a bounded joint semi-lattices as long as we can guarantee some other things are true. I don't have any time to talk about that. Um, but once we've relaxed all the conditions properly and we've figured out all the other conditions we need, we can encode way more stuff into this. And so we can, we can build propagator networks that build lazier functions than you can write directly in Haskell. Um, you know, when we, do, when we compute the AND of two bools, it's always lazy in the second parameter, right? If the first one's false, then the conjunction's false, and we don't need to compute the second thing. Using propagators, with some stuff I haven't shown you, you can write an AND that is lazy in both sides. <laughs> Eventually you can, um, you can start encoding search into this thing, and that, that's when it gets really fun. So then I can start doing things like sat solving, um, I can do constraint satisfaction problems properly, uh, I can do inter integer linear programming and other sorts of things like that. And a really cool one is unification. So you can use propagators to build a type system, right? And then you can just like run it backwards for free. That's cool. And there's loads more cool stuff we can do with propagators. I don't have time to talk about it today. But the point that I really want to get across, I wasn't even trying to sell you on propagators. What I'm really trying to sell you on is the kind of thinking behind that insight. We faced a problem with our model, and instead of coming up with an ad hoc solution, we looked to mathematics. And we said to mathematics, hey, mathematics, what's going on? Look, I've got, this, I've got these cells, right, and I want to accumulate information in them in parallel, and I want to always get the same answer. And mathematics said, oh, accumulating in information in a way that's resilient to parallelism, that's called a semi-lattice. Well, we said, wow, thanks, mathematics. <laughs> so that's actually much harder than I just described, but it's the kind of thing I really think you should do. Finding principled abstractions did not just solve our problems. We had a model, we had a problem, we solved it by looking to mathematics, and the solution actually turned out to be way cooler than the original thing we had a problem with. That's the key insight from this talk, and that's the end of the talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, go on. You talked at the start about working with um, electrical engineers, I think, yeah? Yep. Have you, um, have you actually worked with any um, regarding the application of this? Because this is really awesome, cute, wonderful. Um, yeah, and if anybody's tried to um, analyze circuits with uh, spice or something, there's a lot of, you know, inf uh, finite uh, mathematics and stuff, but this multiple, um, parallel, immensely parallel programming sort of concept. I think this is just awesome. Um, and I can see it's got lots of applications if, if you get to work with some electrical engineers because we're, we're, we're struggling with this all the time. Um, yeah. Because um, it's just, I mean, that, that was a comment and really it was, have you played with any of this sort of stuff in, even in little made up, Situations. That was, yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't used this to do anything with electric circuits. Um, I, there are some fun examples in the repository where I do um, propagation of intervals and I, I have measurements with error bars and that kind of thing. Um, but, 
in, there's a talk that was given by Gerald Sussman in 2011 called We Don't Know How to Compute, where he talked about the propagator model as he viewed it at the time. Um, and in that, he went through more of an example of here's a circuit and here it is as a propagator, you know, it has like 50 lines of scheme or whatever. Um, and so if you go and watch that talk from him, he talks all about that kind of stuff there. Is error handling a pain in the propagator model or do you just incorporate it into the information accumulation thing? Yeah, awesome question. Um, is error handling a pain? So we do handle errors with things like contradiction where you sort of, um, you'll, you'll be building these semi-lattices and you'll kind of have a chunk of semi-lattice that's error related and you'll kind of get stuck in there. Uh, kind of once you've hit an error, you can never add information to kind of get out. And um, that could be finer grained or it could just be contradiction, the top node, which is like game over. Um, what I didn't have time to show, which is really cool, is that the way you incorporate search into this thing is that you look for when contradiction happens and then you add some more, you can write propagators that add propagators and cells to the network. And so whenever you hit contradiction, you write a new propagator to make sure that you never get into that state again, and then you restart the network. So that's like, yeah, we, that's like the best error handling I've ever heard of. It's like, make sure I never hit this error again, and then try again. <laughs> Great talk, George, as usual. Um, both your talk and Jack's talk feel like they make an interesting infrastructure for building compilers. Uh, do you know of anyone who's actually doing that? And is it Ed Commit? Yes, it's Ed Komet. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there are propagator implementations. There's one in Clojure called Propaganda, and there are some talks about that that you can go and watch online. Um, there's, a, there's an old propagator implementation in Haskell called Propagators that I use for all my example code that goes along with this talk. Um, that project is abandoned as being too naive and too slow, um, but it looks really nice for all my examples. And over here, this project, GitHub eComet Guanxi, this is a fancy experimental propagator implementation based on the cutting edge opinions about what propagators should be like today, where, um, as I understand it, Ed wants to write a really crazy type system, and the best way he knows how to do that is to write a really crazy logic programming language with propagators. Um, I've contributed to that project, and maybe you'd like to as well, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, hi, George. Um, it seems to me that Jack's talk about Reflex and FRP also fits with propagators in the sense that propagators seem static. How good are FRP style behaviors and events at becoming semi-lattices? And if they are not good, what is, how do you put time into propagators? Because circuits, for instance, if you're modeling, change over time. Yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, so there's certainly an interesting overlap between propagators and FRP. Um, there are lots of ways to define functional reactive programming, but my favorite one is the sort of original one, which is that functional reactive programming has a denotational semantics and it has a continuous notion of time. Um, whereas I see functional reactive programming as a very denotational creature, propagators are an intensely operational beast. Um, and so, I think I would be interested in using propagators as an implementation substrate to build a cool FRP library on top of, um, but I wouldn't, I'm not sure if I would try to go about um, trying to make propagators behave in a more FRP looking way, if that makes sense. Paul had a question as well. If there's time, sorry. There's a couple of ways to optimize this. Um, because this comes from um, uh, finite domain constraint solving as well. Like yeah, is, that, is, that, is, it, yeah, there's that, lots that's of, one of the things you said. Yeah, definitely. So the propagation, there are lots of things we're doing that turn out to fit into the model of propagation and constraint solving, constraint propagation is, is one of them, yeah. I do actually have a question. I'm not trying to well actually. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was <laughs> cutting into Paul's question to give that short explanation. No, sorry, Paul, go on. Um, so... One of the couple of the things you can do is when a propagator fires and updates the domain of, of or sorry, the 
what did you call them? The circles? The this value of a cell? The value of the cell. When it updates a cell and other propagators are listening to that cell, then those are the ones you want to like schedule for firing. Yep. Which of these libraries handles that? Um, I don't know much about the closure library other than it works and all the examples that I like to play with work in it. The naive propagator library in Haskell that's just called propagators, which is like an abandoned project, has a really naive scheduler. Mm -hmm. um, Edward Komet has given a two-hour talk that's um, his grand vision for propagators one day. I imagine he knows what he's doing. Where he talks about his ideas about scheduling, and he steals lots of ideas from things like sat solving, and he says, oh, I can steal this idea of... Um, I can steal this idea of a two-watch literal scheme to make sure my propagators don't wake up too often, and all this kind of stuff. And I believe that's eventually intended to go into Guanxi. So if you'd like to implement that in Guanxi, let's talk about that. <laughs> I think that's all. Uh, thank you, George.